Let me show these suckers how to ball out here. Oh, man. Let me get this together here. Oh, layup. Oh, shot. Oh, three. Three. Oh, it's like Brick City out here. Mid-range. Oh, my goodness. I can't buy a bucket out here. I missed the whole damn basket. Oh, my goodness. What's going on, man? My game is looking trash. Right. Oh, here we go. Black Power Media shirt. Now we cooking. Now we cooking. Tree. Tree. I'm taking all three of y'all with these right here. Between the legs. Oh, my goodness. Behind the back. Layup. Oh, and then he just do a reverse. He is in beast mode out here. I ain't got to look. It's falling. Oh my goodness, this guy is going three, two, one. Kobe! Nice. Black Power Media, baby. Nice. Empower yourself. Go get me some of that Black Power Media again. Right here, Black Power Media. Yep. Yeah. I mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like. What's up, world? Welcome to another edition of I Mix What I Like right here on Black Power Media. Again, I'm Jared Ball. Very happy to be your host. Please do, as always, as we always ask, uh, like, share, subscribe, join, put this in your socials, let other know, uh, let others know you are here and that they should come and join you. Uh, if you're seeing this later, Welcome to you as well. Like, share, subscribe. Do the same thing. Don't be stingy. And yeah, let's get into it. So uh, for a long time, I have been familiar with this person's work going back now to uh, almost 20 years, actually, and have made sure that wherever I end up in terms of broadcasting, I try to invite him on at some point because the work and the research is fascinating it's different from almost all others, uh, certainly prominent uh, efforts that uh, address themselves to Tupac and even broader issues and other artists as well. Uh, his The link to his website is in the show description, so you should follow up and look into that work some more. And of course, I'm talking about John Potash who among other things is a, a, a graduate of Columbia University Graduate School. He has published two, at least two major works on the interrelationship of art, pop culture, media, and the state. Uh, the first of which came out in 2007 uh, and is uh, titled The FBI's War, the FBI war on Tupac, Shakur, and, and black leaders. Uh, in May 2015, he released uh, another book, Drugs as Weapons Against Us, the CIA's murderous targeting of SDS, Panthers, Hendricks, Lennon, Cobain, Tupac, and other activists. Fascinating work. I've even seen the documentary on it. And he's back to join us now to talk about the most recent uh, on goings on related to Keefe D's arrest and the claim that Tupac Shakur's murder and death have been solved and he doesn't think so so john welcome back to the platform it's good to see you again thanks for joining us thanks for having me on again jared so let's start as i said before uh, you know because this can get very your work is very detailed it's very complex there's so many names and overlaps and acronyms we can't get to all of it, so I really want to encourage people to read the work uh, uh, and check out the, the the work beyond just this discussion, uh, which for some, it may be shocking. But let's start with this, again, this is sort of inverted pyramid, the immediate arrest last week or so, uh, last couple of weeks of, of Keefe D, and what many seem to be reporting is the, 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 the closing of the door, the closing of the case. Uh, uh, the 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 killing of Tupac Shakur. 
in short, as short as you can make it, I guess, what's wrong with that narrative? Well, first of all, Keefe D supposedly said we said all this um, in a you know alleged confession with uh, Greg Kading, a police detective, um, where he he says that he was in the car um, where his nephew. Orlando Anderson was also in the car, was a supposed shooter of uh, Tupac, and that he, that he got a million dollars from P. Diddy or Puff Daddy at the time. Um, and it's just all, it all comes under the fact that he was being offered, he, he was facing, according to Greg Kading's book, uh, he was facing Keefe D, you know, Dwayne Keefe D. Davis was facing uh, life in prison. And he was given, he was let off charges completely for drug, you know, drug dealing charges in order to say what he said to Greg Kading. And, um, you know, civil rights attorney Ben Crump said in, in the series, Who Killed Tupac, when he was, you know, interviewing Greg Kading about this, and he got Greg Kading to say this on, on film, that he was let off of all these charges, let off of life in prison in order to say what he said. He, he said, and another veteran journalist was with him, agreed that people will say anything to get off of a life, you know, life term in prison. And so um, he said what Greg Kading wanted him to say, which is, okay, my dead nephew um, killed Tupac. I was in the car. I was a witness and I set it up. And so now um, I don't have to face life in prison. And so he says that's completely unreliable, you know, unreliable testimony when it comes that way. And so and that's, apparently that's, Keefe has been saying this on platforms too, right? Uh, right. Is that that he's been repeating this story and has been sort of telling on himself for a while now? Yeah. So it's, after nothing happened to him for the next few years, he thought he could make some money off it. So he continued saying what what Greg Kading said mm-hmm. that he, you know, his supposed confession. And the whole story is is pretty fantastical in general. That this million dollars that Puffy would give to you know kill these kill and they said it was to kill Tupac and Suge Knight and here you have now remember that uh the police that investigated this particularly Russell Poole Russell Poole was the original investigator of the whole situation between uh Biggie's murder he was investigating Biggie's murder just because he he had stumbled upon a related murder and he asked that he be he'd be allowed to investigate it with the lead investigator okay and so they thought that Russell Poole could be confided in, could be trusted, the, the powers that be, the higher ups in the LAPD who are involved in police intelligence and work with police and you know, work with the FBI and CIA because that's the way police intelligence works. It's the lowest level of US intelligence. Next level up is FBI, and they often overlap the FBI and, and police intelligence. And then higher up than that is the CIA, but they all work together. And I found this, you know, in in Political murder after political murder in, in many assassinations, you see this this level. It happened against the Panthers and it continues to happen to today. And so you have um you know police intelligence uh basically just um squashing when Russell Poole found that dozens and dozens of his fellow agents were at all levels of death row records, and when he told uh award-winning documentary filmmaker Nick Broomfield that he believes his fellow police officers killed uh, Biggie in order to cover up their murder of Tupac. Um, that stands for a lot. And when he told his higher ups that we, are, what are my fellow officers doing in you know at all levels of death row records? They told him you can call them troubleshooters or covert agents. Those were the exact words of his superiors. Now they didn't expect him to blow the whistle on that, but he did. He came out. He he. Uh, tried to tell more to the press they shut him up they demoted him for doing that and then he was forced to resign that was the only way he could get his information out and when he did and he held a press conference nick broomfield uh ended up covering that press conference and then you know uh interviewed him in depth for his film biggie and tupac and veteran reporter randall sullivan interviewed him in depth and saw all of his records for uh his book labyrinth and I and I used uh, you know a lot of that. I had already come up with a whole kind of version of Tupac, which is basically the fact that you know of course Tupac was a Black Panther leader. He was a New African Panther leader, you know, a national leader, elected as a national leader of that group before he became a, a rapper. And so um, and we know. 
from the U.S. you know the counterintelligence program records, the FBI records that were stolen, that counterintelligence program, the FBI was murderously targeting the Black Panthers, and then you know uh, basically an FBI uh, COINTELPRO agent, um, Wes Swearingen, said that 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 program continued under different names at least into the mid '90s when Tupac was being murderously targeted. And um, so, so just real quick before yeah. we keep going, I want to start. I want to back up real quick to, sure. to, to well to the end. Yeah, sure. And with this, this what what I titled the thumbnail. Uh, well, on the thumb, like why now though? Yeah. Why is 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 is, is why is Keefe D being arrested now? Why is this being said to be rap? It, 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 it did something new happen that I'm missing? I, like, well, what? I, think, I think it relates to the latest reports that that uh, many people of color are not joining the military. They don't. They don't believe in the government. They don't trust the government. Uh, they they are, it, you know it, it, enrollment in the military is way down, uh, especially amongst people of color. And um, and I believe it's because of information's gotten out there that yes, the government killed Tupac, really, who's the most beloved entertainer, you know, uh, probably in history of you know of all races, but particularly of people of color. Um, Tupac, you know, his his fame continues. We know that his fame continues, and and people he's beloved. You know, he's continues to be beloved, Tupac, for his politics and his music. And uh, and his film is his film work. But I mean, I talk to people even from uh, Serbs and Croatians who, who grew up in war torn Yugoslavia, who who do, you know, who send me things all the time. They say, we love what you told about Tupac. And he, he was, you know, we loved him. We, we grew up. He, you know, he you know, helped me survive war torn Serbia, you know, um, when the U.S. was dropping bombs on Serbia. I, I get people from like you know what what Tupac called the, the lost tribes all over the world, you know, just l- still loving Tupac and being inspired by Tupac. But people, you know, people in our country in particular, I think they've lost the you know the government thinks they've lost the trust of the common people that they recruited for the for the military, and now they're trying to regain that trust, and they're you know taking it all the way this. This bogus information from Greg Kading and Dwayne Keefe D. Davis that no one was accepting, um, and so they're trying to pretend like okay, now they solved this this case, and you know it's it's a joke. Keefe D. Davis says in an interview that um, his nephew that supposedly shot Tupac actually after the the uh, beating, which which uh, Orlando Anderson did take in the you know in that hotel lobby because people um, manipulated Tupac to say. Oh, this guy, Orlando Anderson, snatched a chain from my neck, and that had happened to Tupac the year before. And um, so he helped them when he was drunk and stoned. He was he was actually being he was sober for a long time before this, for months before this, according to witness accounts. And so they got him drunk and stoned at a uh, you know a death row party right before the Mike Tyson fight to to in order to manipulate him more easier. So they got him to get involved in the scuffle with uh, Orlando Anderson. And Orlando Anderson just came out of that scuffle and didn't press any charges, didn't do anything, um, acted like it was no big deal. And he was paid. He was obviously paid to take that beating in order to set up an excuse for why Tupac might have been murdered. And so now Keefe D says in an interview recently that um, Orlando Anderson actually um, hurt his arm so badly he had to go to the emergency room right after that scuffle. And he was in a sling coming out of the emergency room. His right arm was in a sling, he said. And so here he is. He says in an interview, his right arm's in a sling. But he also says that Orlando Anderson then got in a car with him and with his right arm in a sling, then shot Tupac 13 times, you know, um, and did and was so so careful in his shooting that he, did, t- he didn't yeah. hit Ignite directly once, okay? And Puffy you know, had paid a million dollars, supposedly, purportedly, for them both to be killed, you know, but they so carefully just killed Tupac and not Suge Knight. So it's just, it's such so, a so ridiculous, their story. So, so, but, but real quick, I, I'm sorry to keep going back, but. That's okay. So I am aware at least of some of the reporting over the last year or so about military recruitment going down. Mm-hmm. But, uh, but honestly, I haven't seen reporting that's specific to 
the the specifically that so-called minority in 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 uh, enlistment is down. It's sort of a general uh, enlistment is down, and it's even been reported to be recently at crisis levels low. Yeah, uh, and yeah. I've you know I've seen a couple you know outlets talking about is it is it wokeness is it not wokeness to be blamed for it and uh uh but what makes you think specific to that that there's a relationship specific to pop and right. that this 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 uh, and having Keefe D confess and be arrested uh would would somehow absolve the government well, you got to remember that um, Tupac was beloved by white and black and Latino youth. And he still is. He still is. He's still, you know, a huge percentage of the people that bought Tupac's music were white. You know, a majority really is according to the statistics. And um, so he was beloved universally by youth. And I think he still is. And, and a lot of you know white youth, too, loved rap. And when they hear, you know, the... Uh, the rumor, you know, supposedly just a rumor, when they hear the kind of work that we've talked about repeatedly, Jared, that uh, that others are now, you know, have talked about. Um, I had my film out um, for free um, for three years. I had that that more rudimentary the FBI War on Tupac Shakur film um, and Black Leaders film for free on YouTube, and just one person who had it up had a million views. Um, and so there was a number of people that had it up for free and there was, I think there was millions of people that saw it. And, um, I just think that the words gotten out there and it's caused both white and black youth to not trust the government as much and to not want to fight for the government, you know? Okay. Now, I mean, I, that, I, okay. I, I mean, I, I just was curious. That's, that's sure. That's so, okay. So. I think, again, I want to keep encouraging people to really look at your work because it is very thoroughly researched. So, uh, uh, and that, that, that the, the, um, yeah. So I want to, so I know, and I know we can't get to every detail, but having gotten to the point where you're comfortable or confident in saying that KVD could not have shot Pac, could not have shot him at all, much less with that level of accuracy, uh, to not hit Shug and to, you know, this, that, and that. Just to be clear, Keefe D said he was in the car, but he said that his nephew, Sorry. Orlando and Anderson, he shot at Tupac, yeah. Thank you for correcting but, me. Now. Yeah, but Orlando Anderson was, was not a marksman. He let, was not a professional killer. Well, and let me ask you. Professionals, according to the police. Okay, to, so yeah. let me ask you in the in this way, because I heard you earlier today, I was listening to a recent interview you gave uh, and the about this. And one of the interviewers, which I thought was quite interesting, you know, uh, fascinating, said that that though he's not from the area, he's he's he is uh, uh, of of Baltimore, and because you're from Maryland, so mm -hmm. so I know that 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 there was some discussion of uh, this this interviewer was saying, you know, I I have some familiarity with Baltimore and even Baltimore police, and I just know them to be you know hardworking, good guys, and. You didn't. I don't know what your views are, but you, you know, you didn't. You didn't say anything. You just. You just kept it going. But I'm listening to that, and I'm thinking, how could anyone pay any bit of attention, even to the recent headlines coming out of the Baltimore police, and think that just this blanket, <laughs> you know, uh, 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 more to the point, I'm thinking of is that this leads people to having difficulty in some cases. Uh, understanding why you might argue that the police were were tangentially more immediately involved, or why uh, something like this could have happened to Pac and others involving the police and a broader state apparatus. In other words, if people can can you know still walk around with this, oh, the, the cops are basically good guys. Everybody's good guys. Uh, uh, how can we get people to have a more critical analysis of the police involvement in 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 suppression, colonization, abuse of of politicized celebrity, so on and so forth? So that was just one t side. Th so so, but proceeding from that, could you talk more about why then you're you're so convinced that, as you said, the police would have been sure that this was a professional hit, that that Anderson and and Keefe could have had nothing to do with it. 
And then why do you end up arguing that the police and the state were involved? Yeah, well, Russell Poole, who was just one, you know, look, there's a percentage of police, that, of course, that that are honest or try to be honest. But there's also a percentage of police that are working with U.S. intelligence that are carry out the, you know, it was it was not the FBI that murdered Fred Hampton directly. It was the police that murdered Fred Hampton directly, you know, as an example. But the FBI orchestrated it. They, you know, they did what they needed to do to orchestrate it. And above them, the CIA supervised the FBI and the FBI's orchestration of the police murdering Fred Hampton. It's the same way with Tupac. It's police, you know, uh, on the ground who are direct, more directly involved in the FBI. Some of the, now some of these police were both FBI and police. Like uh, there was an officer, uh, his name leaves me at the, at the moment, but that was uh, taking pictures of Biggie right before he was killed. And Nick Broomfield found, and, and with overlapping what Nick Broomfield uh, came out with in his film, plus what Randall Sullivan had in documents he had from um, Russell Poole's case files, you find that this officer, and I name him in my, my book, at least I know the new version of my book, um, uh, the FBI war on Tupac Shakur, uh, this, this officer was both FBI and New York police, you know, at the same time. And he was out in Los Angeles taking pictures of Biggie just before he was murdered. So this is the way it works. They overlap, the police carry out the police, you know, intelligence, you know, officers carry out the FBI's orchestration of these, these operations. And this is the way it works, you know. And so you find that against the Panthers and you find that against, you know, new, one time new African Panther leader Tupac Shakur when he is carrying out uh, some excellent activist work in getting the Bloods and Crips to call peace truces and turn on to activism, you know, helping his Black Panther extended family in that cause. Because that, that was who he really was. He really was a, a serious, you know, radical le- activist. Um, and he was only pretending to be a gangster. This is according to his mentor, Watani Tayahimba, who confided in me, yes, he, he was only pretending to be a gangster in order to appeal to gangs and politicize them. And that was what Thug Life was about. You know, was yeah, but pro- did you see him more recently, though? Did you see the Hulu Dear Mama series? Because Watani and others were then have more recently said the opposite, that they felt like he got co-opted by his, that his portrayal of Thug Life uh, 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 corrupted him and he became enveloped by it and that it was see, not, no longer a portray- portrayal and it caused them to break with him. Well, let me just say this, that um, I know Jamal Joseph's been shown a lot with that, with that, um, you know, uh, producer of the main producer of, of that recent series. And Jamal, I have in my, my film coming up, I have Jamal Joseph saying that Tupac was taken out by, uh, you know, members of uh, the police, FBI's uh, latter day COINTELPRO operations. And so I have him saying that in my film coming up. And and that you know I'll be coming out within five or six months. So Jamal is is very clear, very straightforward about that in an interview he did with, um, uh, forget the name of the, the group, but uh, I had part of it in my last film, in my Drugs as Weapons film, but I, I didn't realize at the very end he directly says that what I just said. I'll be coming out with that you know soon. But um, that's so, kind of deep, though. I mean, because yeah. that. Wow. Yeah, I mean, that's a complete outright. contradiction from the Dear Mama series. Right. That, so the that, Dear Mama series, wow. you, got, you got to remember the Dear Mama series that, that uh, you know, that that brother, I forgot his name all of a sudden, you know, who uh, who did yeah, that. The, the, the Hughes brothers. He, right? Yeah, the Hughes brother who did that. He he's very mainstream and he's, you know, he's he's going to cover some things up. The more mainstream and the more publicity you get, the more money that's in it and the the less you can really reveal stuff, sadly enough. And that's just the way it is. Now he revealed some good stuff. And so I thought some parts of it were, were great, dear mama, but the, the end was very problematic. Obviously he, he obviously just took snippets to, to make it look like that Jamal Joseph and Watani Tayhimba are agreeing that it was, you know, it was gang gang war that killed Tupac, which is ridiculous. Watani, I, I interviewed Watani, you know, several times, an hour each time, and uh, he had to look at my interview and okay everything I had in there before I put it in my book. And so he urged me to turn my Covert Action Quarterly article into the book that it became. 
And so he is very you know, definitive about, yes, the FBI orchestrated you know, the murder of Tupac. Now, well, if you course, ever talk to him again, ask him what he thinks of that Hulu series and see yeah, if he'll go sure. on record with it, because that's deep. Because then, yeah. then he should be furious. He should be. He should be. I would think then he had, he would have been loudly protesting what that series did to his likeness. Then it doesn't matter how loud he would protest, though. He knows that matter. mainstream media is not going to cover his protest. That's the problem with that. And you know that you've, you've experienced this. Kind but of I'm talking about us. We would though. No, I know they yeah, I would, you. but I, I, oh. yeah. Anyway, but I, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. No, that's I don't, okay. I but Watani has yeah. been wary of a lot of film projects like this. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Kathleen Cleaver told me she called Watani to get, get him involved in another film project by some French journalist. And, um, and he didn't want to, he didn't want to get involved because he kept, you know, he kept getting his stuff just selected, selected carefully his interviews and not covered fully, not covered right. So they can take a little part of what he says and make it look like he agrees with other stuff in the film that, that isn't what he says. And that's the way it usually works. And the same thing with Jamal, I'm sure. Because Jamal Joseph, you know, he asked if I would sign the copy of my book that I gave to him when I when I ran into him. And uh he, you know, and he just put it across very straightforwardly about yes, it was FBI's, you know, uh, type of co and tell pro type operation he said that did in Tupac. Um, and so, yeah, you know, this is just the way it works, the way they cover things up where the way, you know, these well, you know, well-funded mainstream series will do that. They did that with unsolved too, when they tried to, um, you know, smear Russell Poole and raise up Greg Kading to look so honest. They got Mo Preem Shakur to co-produce, you know, that's Tupac's, um, stepbrother. He's a great guy and, and totally, you know, agrees with my work. And that's why he gave me a, a song for my, um, you know, uh, film Drugs as Weapons Against Us. And um, Mo Preem and his wife Talia are very well-meaning, good good activists. And um, Mo Preem basically uh, said, just talking to him recently, that um, that they, they got him to co-produce this Unsolved series. Then they brought in Bray, uh, Greg Kading as another producer. And they gave Greg Kading the run, the run of things. And so, you know, all of a sudden, Greg Kading's got too much power when the Unsolved series. And so they smear, uh, you know, Russell Poole when they make Greg Kading, you know, look like this great guy in that ridiculous series. Now, the series, you know, I'm glad they at least showed, you know, put a lot of attention on Russell Poole, which he deserved. But um, as you saw with um, Biggie Small's mother, who, uh, who played herself in this Johnny Depp um, version film that came out during the uh, COVID crisis. So most people didn't see it, but it was, uh, it, you know, it was stopped by the LAPD. This film, this film was not allowed to come out. There was basically three films that tried to do justice to the book Labyrinth and, and to Russell Poole's story in coming out with what he came out with about his fellow cops murdering Tupac. And, um, and they all got squashed. One with Leonardo DiCaprio was with a DreamWorks, you know, film that was where he was going to play Russell Poole. Another one by Sylvester Stallone, where he was going to play Russell Poole. And finally, this one with Johnny Depp playing Russell Poole came, came out. The other two got squashed by LAPD. That's how powerful they are. I didn't see the Johnny. I didn't see her. I didn't. Where is this Johnny the, Depp film? John, yeah, the Johnny Depp one. Um, you can look up like the you know filmography of Johnny Depp, and you'll see it. I think it's called City of Dreams. Now, it doesn't cover Tupac that much, but what it does do well, and the important thing about it, because it doesn't, you know, it, it, it doesn't cover Tupac like it should, like I wish it would have, but nonetheless, it does show that, that Russell Poole is very credible, and there's Biggie's mother playing herself in the film, meeting Russell Poole and thanking him for all he did to help, you know, uncover what happened with, the, with death row police killing, you know, her son Biggie. And uh, so it shows that Russell Poole did serious, credible, uh, honest work, and um, and you know he's in the, in the last basically page of the book Labyrinth, he says that um, all his friends said not to trust the FBI and not to give his his files to the FBI. But he says if I can't trust them, who can I trust? So he copied them all and sent them to the FBI. And of course, nothing happened with them. The FBI didn't do anything about them because he didn't realize they were involved. And so, um, but that's, you know, that's just basically the way, you know, this all played out. Now, Russell Poole, 
is not with us anymore. And they pretend in the film, you know, in the series Unsolved that he just, you know, coincidentally had a heart attack in the middle of offering new evidence to a police sheriff in Los Angeles County. In the sheriff's office. In the sheriff's office. Now, his co-writer, Michael Carlin, Russell Poole ended up writing um, a book with a writer named Michael Carlin. And that co-writer who he wrote that book with says, right, um, I'm glad Jacques LaRoche says, the city of lies, not city of dreams. Thank you. Um, So Michael Carlin told me that a source within the uh, police department says he was at that meeting and he he witnessed, you know, he said Russell Poole was shocked that Reggie Wright Jr. was in that meeting. And because he because, of course, Russell Poole blames you know Reggie Wright as part of Tupac's murder, you know, as being, you know, um, culpable for at, or helping orchestrate Tupac's Wait, murder. Wright was in the meeting where in the meeting of a heart attack. He was Hold in on. the meeting. And he said that police force <laughs> said that they didn't he didn't have a heart attack. What happened is a bunch of police held Russell Poole down. They got a defibrillator out and they gave him uh, shocks to the heart until he, his heart stopped. That's what they did. They killed him in that meeting. Mm-hmm. And that's what that police source told Michael Carlin, who told me that. Now, all right, I know we're not. Yeah. People got to read your work because, and I, I don't think I'm helping here. Why is this guy being at the meeting so crazy, though? Back up and tell us. Yeah. So like why so, why would I be having this reaction in here? Right. Why would this dude be even allowed to be there? Right, That's crazy. Right. It, it is. And so remember, I said that one of you know, Tupac's top activist projects was helping his Black Panther extended family get the Bloods and Crips to call peace truces and then turn on to activism. That that started in Los Angeles right before the uh, L.A. riots over you know rodney king you know la we call them la rebellions because it was a rebellion over them letting off all those police officers filmed beating up rodney king for no reason and so they uh they basically um you know police were just indiscriminately murdering uh you know people you know especially uh gang members in in la and so when when they started to call the peace truces and start to turn on to activism uh, Tupac, you know, wrote the Code of Thug Life with his father, Matulu Shakur. Um, they, they developed the Thug Life plan, whether he was going to pretend to be a gangster and peel the gangs and politicize them. It was, it was very successful. He was getting peace truces to happen uh, throughout Los Angeles and then throughout California. That was spreading throughout the country. And peace truces and turning, you know, gangs turning into activists was happening throughout the country to the point that in New York City, the largest street gang, the Latin Kings, converted to the Almighty Latin King and Queen Nation, you know, which was very activist and laid down their guns and stopped drug dealing and stuff. And that was documented by professors in New York. And uh, I interviewed King Tone, who did that, Antonio King Tone Fernandez, and his uh, his mentor, and talked to him about all that transformation. And I also interviewed their, his mentor from the uh, Young Lords, who helped that happen. And um, so... This was major. This this is what got the CIA involved, I argue, because this took away the the you know street dealers of all the cocaine and heroin that the CIA was trafficking. I mean, if you read the politics of heroin, you know the CIA traffics uh, heroin. If you read you know Peter Dale Scott's books about the cocaine CIA you know trafficking cocaine, you know the CIA is involved in cocaine trafficking. I mean, up until the last five years, you had, uh, you know, ships that were, J, you know, um, J.P. Morgan ships, vessels were caught with like a ton of cocaine. 60 Minutes has, has done, you know. John, we don't need this. all of those so, legit sources. We yeah, know so, that Mel Gibson even made a damn movie right, about right. CIA trafficking drugs. Yeah. So if Mel yeah, makes right. a movie about it, it's got to be real. Yeah, Sorry, so, Virginia. well, it's but just, do, yeah, yeah, you just know this stuff is happening. And so... You, you end up getting um, you get all these street level dealers. They found when they did uh, when they did a mass uh, arrest of all the Latin kings that had transformed to activists, they found no drugs and they found no guns. And so he got a huge amount of activists off the street, you know, King Tone and the, the Latin kings. And, and throughout the country, this was happening. This was taking billions and billions of dollars of drug profits out of the CIA's hands 
and out of the banker's hands that were laundering that money. And now the stock market um, that was laundering that money and that st the stock market was losing mass amounts of money. I explain how that all works in, in Drugs as Weapons Against Us. You have a woman in that documentary summarizing, I forgot her name, but she comes Catherine out of that. Catherine Austin Fitz, yeah. Cast yeah. Catherine Austin Fitz. Yeah. And it's remarkable the amount of, of what she's able to document that you that you back up also uh you supplement that that point you're making i just want to highlight that for people yeah, that you, you that that there's there's tremendous amounts of money being laundered through the banking system mm -hmm. far more I, for, I forgot the number but you if, if i'm not mistaken you said it's the laundered money through the banking system is larger than the the national gdp well, we're talking, I mean, or, the United Nations talked about like hundreds of millions, I mean, hundreds of billions of dollars being okay, so I'm wrong on that. I'm wrong. laundered okay, I'm by the, the major banks internationally. And each of the major banks has been caught as they even admitted to the fact that they haven't checked one and allowed the laundering of hundreds of billions of dollars. I th I'm sorry. I thought you were saying it was in the trillions. Okay. I'm sorry. My fault. Yeah. My fault. No, I mean, if you add it all up, it, you, it may, it may add up to over a trillion dollars, but Nonetheless, it's just a okay. huge amount of money. And so we're talking about all that money was was really, you know, affecting the the you know wealthiest families in our country, this and people that own these stocks and the and US intelligence that was involved in the drug trade. And so Tupac's efforts, because he was so popular, and because he could get these gang leaders to meet and, you know, call peace truces and agree to to do things differently. Um, and he could inspire you know these these gang leaders throughout the country to do this. That was why he was such a threat, and that's why they they took him out. Sadly enough, you know, because he was that I, again. I'm 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 messing I'm messing you up. I think I'm yeah. uh, again. Uh, but but I wanted I just wanted to come back because when you're uh, I want you to say a little bit more about who right, Reggie Wright right, is Jimmy. because again I'm I'm still stuck on that moment of you telling right. us that he's right. in the room when Russell Poole is showing up. And having read your work and some others, yeah. if 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 I can only imagine, and again, so, it's yeah, hard for me to have sympathy for a police officer. But Russell Poole's one of the few that had that right. that was able to pull on it. So I, if, if I think about how Russell must have felt, I would think that maybe I, I'm not disputing what you're saying happened, but yeah. I could see if he walks in the room and sees Reggie there, maybe he would have a heart attack. Yeah, no, it scared. It, it would have really scared him, no doubt, but. The key was that Reggie. The reason I brought this up is because Reggie Wright Jr.'s father would he, was head of the Compton Gang Task Force for the you know Compton Police, you know the, that Los Angeles neighborhood of uh, police, and that was one of the first places in in Los Angeles that the gang peace shoes started. Okay, and the conversion to activism started was in Compton and two other neighborhoods. So um, the reason his son, you know Reggie Wright Jr was so important was because they were connected that way. And Reggie Ray Jr. was a police officer who was then, you know, was pretended to retire from the, resigned from the police force to head death row record security. But it's obvious that he was still doing the work with his father of trying to counter the gang peace truce movement through um, this, co these covert operations in death row records, lording over all these dozens of what were called covert agents by a you know LAPD superior, because Death Row Records was drug trafficking and gun running, and specifically trying to to end the peace truces between the Bloods and the Crips. They were causing shootouts between Bloods and Crips, even at a Snoop Dogg concert, believe it or not, where people got killed. And uh, Snoop didn't know what was going on. He didn't know why this was suddenly you know you know shootings were breaking out. And but Death Row was causing fights in in Death Row studios between Bloods and Crips. Um, when the shooting the happened, FBI, at, I mean, what's that? Yeah, I, I think you you misspoke there. You you were saying that Death Row created. I'm sorry. Oh, who yeah, were you death, saying? The Death Death Row Records actually these these undercover agents in, okay. in Death Row Records these undercover you know undercover police officers that were working for Death Row Records actually helped create these these okay. conflicts at at these Death Row events. And um, as, you know, as I say, in a Snoop Dogg concert, people died and no one was arrested. And uh, so this is just evidence of you know, what they were trying to do. They were trying to end the Bloods Crips peace truce at death row events. And they were tra trafficking guns 
to so when Tupac was shot and you know seven days before he actually died, they they sent tons of guns to Bloods and said the Crips killed Tupac and started the war again. Even though there was supposed to be a peace truce, they started that Bloods versus Crips war, and 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 a number of people died before activists uh, changed the mind of of uh, uh, the Bloods and Crips and said no no it, we don't think it was the Crips you know stop you know get you know get the peace going again and and the, you know they the actually the gang leaders you know started the peace truce again after Tupac died but for a while there it was going on again and uh so this is what was happening so Reggie Wright Jr was integral to trying to stop Tupac and Black Pan his Black Panther extended families movement around politicizing gangs they were trying to stop that this was a movement that the FBI was focusing on in a huge way. President Bush was focusing on it in a huge way, and then Clinton after him, I'm sure, to counter Tupac and his Black Panther extended family's work in that realm. And so that's that's you know part of why Reggie Wright Jr. was so uh, you know horrible of a guy to see at this meeting. And when somebody watches this and they say, well, how does John know that Reggie and these people were doing all of this uh, beyond whatever they're not convinced by in your argument here, they will be able to find the documents, the notes, yeah. the references. All the thousand end notes yeah. documenting the sources for this information of these exact events I'm describing. Um, now, what Michael Carlin said to me, I, I did that was much more recent. I didn't get that in a book or film. I'm sorry to say about Russell Poole because I already moved on to other works, but uh, everything that Reggie Wright Jr. was doing, everything Wright, Reggie Wright Sr. was doing, is all in my you know footnoted in in depth and in detail in my in my books. Yeah, right. So by the time they come to this video and see this new new bit of information, they can go back and they'll have the context that makes it right. make more sense. So that's right. I just want to keep. I, I always feel when we talk, it's important to do that because we're never right. getting the prop, the full context and the full amount of work you bring into this to make the point. Right. So it's, it's, I just want to encourage people to check it out. And then if they still feel like you haven't done enough, so be it. But I just mm -hmm. want to be, be clear that, uh, yes. so, so, okay. So pool has this heart attack, but let's, so let's try to keep building outward from this inverted pyramid. What was he, what was what is Poole's grand narrative and the evidence he brought to bear that made him a threat that pointed again mm -hmm. upwards to to the state's involvement that he he himself was not uh, uh, fully aware of at the time? Right. right. So Poole undermined Greg Kading. Um, so Greg Kading came in maybe five or ten years after Poole in order to undermine what Poole had come out with. That his fellow, you know, Nick Broomfield said that Poole told him that he believes his fellow police officers, again, killed Biggie Smalls to cover up their murder of Tupac to make it look like either an East Coast, West, East Coast, West Coast rap war and or a gang, you know, killing. And so um, Poole was, was getting more and more evidence around that and uh, was coming out with it and was bringing out and was undermining Greg Kading. He wrote uh a comment in one of the amazon pages of you know for greg kading's book which was a complete cover-up book he wrote that uh, that basically greg kading had disgraced himself in court he was caught lying in court and that he was forced to re resign early they brought him out of retirement uh in order to start this campaign of you know pretending to to try to investigate what really happened with the biggie smalls and tupac murder five or 10 years after I came out with my conclusions and he never talked to me, he never tried to talk to me once. I never, you know, I never talked to him directly. He never asked for my, you know, uh, my opinion or my sources or anything for my work, you know? And, uh, and so, you know, he says, um, but he basically undermines Greg Kading's you know, credibility in a major way. And so if he would have continued, been allowed to continue that, you know, by living and coming out with new and more and more information like he was because he was continuing to investigate it, he was present, he was going to present to the uh, police, L.A. Sheriff's Office new evidence of who the actual shooter was, you know, and um, he was killed at that meeting when he was you know, going to do that. So the the. 
So the 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 killer that he was going to reveal to to was who? And again, going upwards, how did how does that? Argument yeah, I'm get sorry us? that I I didn't find that out at this time. I don't. Um, I was when Michael Carlin, you know, called me and talked to me about that stuff. Um, it was just going to be someone who. Who, who wasn't Orlando Anderson? I know that, and I, but because uh, Carlin says no, it wasn't Orlando Anderson. It was, uh, you know, but um, I, I didn't, I didn't get the full information on that. All of that just okay. because I was involved in other projects that I was, you know, by that point, I was working on new new subjects at the time. But um, you know, he was just continuing to do good work in the investigation in general, though. I know that. So, so Poole's narrative never gets heard. Let's, let's continue on with yours then. Who, who, who then did kill Pac and why? Yeah. So, I mean, you know, the, the key is that this is assassination attempt number, you could say number four or five, at least, um, because there was at least, you know, as I say, three, three or four other assassination attempts of Tupac. Okay, Tupac becomes, remember, he becomes head of the New African Panthers by the age of about 17 years old. He's elected head of the New African Panthers who are trying to replicate the Black Panthers. They're active in eight to 10 cities around the country. So I've got him being interviewed as the head of the New African Panthers by a radio station in my film. Um, you can hear more, you can read more about it in my book, but you can also see in the film Drugs as Weapons Against Us. And which is free on many places. People can find just type in drugs as weapons against us. They'll find the film for free, you know, and watch be able to watch it for free many places. If you want to get the DVD, it's got 15, uh, it's got like 12 plus uh, bonus scene, you know, minutes. But, but that, you know, presents that shows that it's um, they tried to hide that leadership, that new African leadership in most places, you know, most mainstream media doesn't talk about that part of his, you know, of his life. But um, that, as I said, that made him a target for the FBI's counterintelligence program because they, they continued under different names, according to an FBI whistleblower, Wes Swearingen. And he came out with that book in a book called um, uh, a memoir of his called FBI Secrets, I believe it's called. Um, so, so here he is. He's, already, he's definitely a target. As soon as he adds more wealth and fame, by uh, signing a uh, independent, you know, label deal. I mean, uh, I'm sorry, a major label deal for Tupacalypse Now, with the upstart, you know, new major label Interscope Records. Then um, he's considered even more dangerous. So he left his New African Panther leadership, but he uh, thought he could get his message out and have more influence with this, you know, rap career. And so he comes out with this political album, Tupacalypse Now. Um, MTV has a worldwide release of his trap song, which is, is a political song. And within several days of, of releasing that, police stop him supposedly for jaywalking. They uh, choke him unconscious and smash and hit his head into a curb repeatedly. And I show two instances where uh, victims died in police custody from those actions of police. So um, then he goes on to uh, have this Marin City Festival. Uh, where he's an invited honorary guest and he's uh, there and strangers uh, come up to him and punch him for no reason and then take out a gun and shoot at him by all, you know, accounts that I, you know, I, the best evidence that I had and I showed the evidence in there from, you know, video interviews of people there from, you know, different journals, you know, newspaper accounts of that incident. And uh, Tupac only, and, and police are watching that. Police are there and watching this and not intervening. That's the key. They only intervened when Tupac smartly, when the uh, basically the um, the people that shot at him ran after him, got a group of people to run after him, chased him, and he, he hid under a, a police car. And they were smashing the police car in order to get at him. And uh, and that's only the only time the police intervened. When the police intervened, they arrested Tupac. And his, uh, you know, stepbrother Moprim uh, Shakur, Moprim Harding Shakur, and they didn't arrest the people that shot at him for no reason, and so that's the way things went. So that was another assassination attempt. Um, then, of course, you had the situation in Atlanta after the uh, a concert, two white uh, police officers that were supposedly off duty, allegedly off duty, 
are carrying a, play, a gun that they stole from an evidence locker, which is called a throwaway gun that you can hide to you know not get traced back to you. And they, uh, according to both white and black eyewitnesses, they ran over to uh, the car, to Tupac's car, smashed the car window, shot at Tupac. Tupac rolled out of the back of the car, grabbed the security guard's handgun behind him, and shot back in self-defense and shot these white police officers in the butt and the leg. Okay. And um, so, again, that, that should have gone to court. Tupac should have been had to go through trial for that. Here's a black young black man shooting a white police officer in deep south, you know, in Atlanta. And it doesn't go all the way to through court at all. It's dropped completely. What part way through? You know, when it's first just they go part way through court and then they drop it completely. Why? Because it was a botched assassination attempt. There's loads of evidence this was a botched assassination attempt. Not I, I don't have time to go through every detail, but you'll see it in my book. Loads of evidence that they you know, this was you know assassination attempt, and that's why they dropped it in court. So then you have, of course, the um, situation where Tupac set up with a sexual assault, supposedly a sexual assault encounter, where he gets one and a half to four and a half years in jail. Where um, now, if you look at all aspects of that, you've got this Haitian Jacques Ignant, you know, that, that's what Tupac calls him in a song, but basically he was known by different aliases. Um, I talked, you know, I worked, talked a few times to uh, Tupac's New York trial lawyer, Michael Tarif Warren, who, uh, who showed me different records on the case. Um, I got Tupac's appeal records and copied them because I happened to luckily get, run to the appeals lawyer through a, a clerk for the appeals lawyer who I knew. And so um, it was uh, clearly, so Michael Tarif Warren says that Haitian Jacques Ignat had a long rap sheet that showed major charges up and down the East Coast, all dismissed. And he said, that's a sure thing of a police intelligence agent, okay? That's a you know clear sign of a police intelligence agent. And so, um, you know, a top uh, benevol a Policeman's Benevolent Association lawyer represents Haitian Jacques Ignat, okay? And he gets his case severed from that trial where he's the one that introduced Tupac to this woman who, who said he, you know, sexually assaulted her. And um, so Haitian Jacques Ignat just gets, um, you know, a misdemeanor for his involvement in that sexual assault, while Tupac gets one and a half to four and a half years in jail. And again, it's clearly, you know, a setup by police and to stop Tupac from speaking out. And then, of course, uh, at the towards the end of that trial for the sexual assault, where they thought they had lost the case, because they really basically had lost the case. Um, Tupac was should have gone free. Um, what happens is Tupac go, is called to a um, uh, recording studio by an associate of Haitian Jacques Ignatz, um, Jimmy, you know, henchman Rosemont, who uh, a French documentary filmmaker showed me uh, documents that said he was a police informant at this time. He was already working with the government as a, not a police informant, but a government informant. Okay. He had signed over, you know, documents saying he would inform for the government, for the district attorney's office. And, uh, at that time when he lured Tupac to that recording studio and several gunmen mug him in the most well-lit place in the world at 11 PM at night, you know, if you're going to do a mugging, why would you do it in a place that's so lit up as Times Square? You know, um, the quad studio where he was supposedly mugged was in Times Square and Tupac's mugged and uh, they shoot him once in, you know, uh, to get him down on the ground and then shoot him twice in the back of the skull to, to assassinate him. And the bullets just barely miraculously missed his brain. And if you look at the doctor's affidavit on that shooting, the two bullets went in the back of the skull and out the front of the skull. And I have pictures of the doctor's affidavit in my original version of my Tupac book. And I have them in my film on Tupac, um, and I think in my Drugs as Weapons film too. But the uh, new version of my Tupac book doesn't have his documents in them, sadly enough. Nonetheless, it's got the you know end notes on them and describes what's in them. And basically, uh, they barely missed assassinating him then in that incident. And uh, two, three police officers immediately arrived on the scene. Uh, they were the same police officers that immediately arrived the scene in another part of New York City in another precinct when Tupac's sexual assault situation happened. 
And Tupac said, you know, oh, Officer McKernan, surprise, surprise, that, you know, you're the first one arriving here. Um, and um, I found out that this officer who was in charge of the two others was working in the street crimes unit. And the street crimes unit was akin, they say it started the uh, year 1971 when the police intelligence unit, the Bureau of Special Services, um, was you know, dis dismantled to hide you know, what they were doing, that the FBI was doing through that kill and tell pro unit. Here comes the street crimes unit doing the same thing, undercover work. And um, here is the guy that arrives as part of that unit. Um, according to someone I talked to in the police, who I, who I pretended like I was you know, doing a pro-police article on the situation. And she admitted to me that he was, you know, he was part of it, part of street crimes. And so um, this is the kind of stuff that shows that the police was involved in several assassination attempts before Tupac was actually assassinated. So, and so, so, so as John, assassination, the FBI were there. They, you know, according to top reporters, the FBI you know, watched the assassination of Tupac in the same way they watched the murder of Biggie. Uh, as so this class. is this yeah. is one of, this is a comment that speaks to what I've been trying to preempt by encouraging people to read your work because we can't get to everything. But but yeah. saying that you're making a lot of claims but not showing evidence, saying people were informants. Where is the paperwork? Uh, yeah. Look, in, in lots of, I show, I have all the end notes of the people I talked to, the woman I talked to at the police precinct where Officer McKernan worked. I think it was McKernan, I believe, was the lead officer, but I have, I have that all documented in my book. I've got the, you know, doctor's affidavit in the first version of my book. I've got it in my film, The FBI War on Tupac Shakur. It's, I believe it's in the Drugs and Weapons film, too. I've got that in there. You can see it all there. It's the, I got, yeah. I, you know, we don't have time to to show every single piece of. I, I don't have time to read at you know end notes to every single thing I'm saying, but you'll see them all there, sure. Yeah, uh, you know, well, I'm not sure where what. Um, let me do this because we're we're coming up on an hour. I want to make sure. Let me let me get this question in uh, sure. from Dr. Orasami Burton. Sure. Uh, can you ask Mr. Potash to comment on the apparent similarities between the FBI media facilitated split within the BPP and the East West Coast beef in hip hop coincidence or conspiracy? Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Kathleen Cleaver told me uh, it's, you know, after reading my article for Covert Action Quarterly, where I outline all the similarities. She said, oh, yeah, now now after reading your article, it's very clear. Um, yeah, they, they use the, the same tactics. They use undercover agents um, in the media and in prison to pretend like somebody, you know, they sent uh, fake letters to Tupac saying, oh, everyone knows that Biggie set you up to be, you know, to be shot. And um, even though Biggie visited Tupac in, in the hospital, when he was recovering from, from, you know, like uh, the shooting that happened in that situation with the quad studios, because Biggie happened to be there on the third or fourth floor. And uh, his, um, you know, his friend, little C's had said hi to Tupac out the window, et cetera. Um, so this, you know, Tupac and, and Biggie were friends before this happened, but everyone, you know, loads of people in jail. Um, and it's really easy to pay people in jail. Like they did with when the, uh, Black Panther, you know, Tupac's mother of the Black Panther 21, the New York Black Panther 21 was in jail. They set up people to pretend like, you know, that they sent, sent fake letters from New York 21 to the Oakland um, National Office of the Black Panthers to set Huey Newton against the, um, you know, the New York Black Panthers. They had undercover agents set up, you know, things to pretend like there's a war between Huey Newton and and the uh, New York Black Panthers, the Fannies Black Panthers. And uh, some of those undercover agents, you know, we know of uh, were in Oakland, Oakland National Office. Um, you know, one of them uh, being a, uh, I forget his name off the top of my head, but uh, it's, it's come out about him. Um, the lesser known is the uh, woman, um, I just forgot her name all of a sudden, our friend in Atlanta, you know who I'm talking about, Jared. Who uh, who opposed um, Cynthia, Congresswoman Cynthia McKinney for the Green Party? Um, she wrote "Taste oh, of Power." Elaine, Elaine Brown. Elaine yeah, Brown. Yeah. yeah. So so what's this about Elaine Brown? So so Elaine Brown was in the national office at the time, 
mm-hmm. along with the, you know a, at least two two or so other undercover agents, and they influenced you know Huey Newton to expel Geronimo Pratt uh, from the Plant Panthers, and Geronimo was close with the New York office, was close with the Phoenician Corps. Geronimo Pratt was head of the L.A. Panthers. Um, they he they influenced you know Huey to think that New York Panthers were against him uh the and you know when the saudi eldridge cleaver they helped set up the the war between eldridge and, and huey but also huey and the new york panthers um you know media assets did the same thing writing articles you know pretending like there's you know conflicts between these two groups that are just conflicts that aren't set up by the government that aren't part of counterintelligence program um you know media assets were used in that regard and so tupac received these fake letters saying these things about biggie uh and and puffy and he also had you know people in jail saying oh everyone knows that puffy and and biggie set you up and things like that so so but this is sort of what i think why not learns question comes from uh you know when for instance in in terms of the 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 history you're talking about here with the (laughs) cointel pro against uh huey and the the east coast panthers we've seen the documents calling for that dr burton uh, Bob Boyle, for instance, have sent me, and we've shown them here, the documents yeah. where you see the FBI saying, get Huey to do this against Daruba, get them right. to do this. Do we have those documents? Do we have something akin to that regarding these efforts to create right. this beef East Coast, West Coast within hip hop and specific to Pac? Is there a COINTELPRO so, memorandum so when I talk, order that you found? Yeah, so when I talk- yeah, when I filed a Freedom of Information Act request for all the uh, FBI documents on Tupac, I, the woman at the Justice Department admitted to me that there was over 4,000 pages in his FBI file. I have the letter. I have the letter in my film. You see, I think you've seen it in my film. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and they were going to send that to me. You know, I have it cost. She admitted it cost 10 cents per page. You have to pay this amount of money. There's 4,000 pages. And I only got uh, about 99 pages, and even those pages were redacted. But so I got the evidence that, th- that she was, you know, just blowing the whistle. She said she wasn't allowed to tell me the amount of pages that were in this file, but I think she was sympathetic to, mo- to what I was try- asking. And she did admit that there was over 4,000 pages that needed to be copied or in his file. And so the only reason we found out about the Black Panther files is not by because of a Freedom of Information Act. It's because his files were stolen. They were broken. You know, they got an FBI office was broken into and those those files were stolen. So Congresswoman Cynthia McKinney tried to, you know, get a bill passed to get all the government documents on Tupac, uh, you know, released. And it just didn't pass in Congress. Um, But uh, she knew that they're there. And um, and so the stuff I'm I'm talking about is from media accounts and testimonies in different parts of the media that say these things and so we don't know why these people said these things because it's it's not clear why they would say i mean you know as i say biggie visit tupac in the hospital right after his shooting um you know biggie did not want to, his friend shot or killed um they you know tupac got biggie his start they were friends but people uh you know and and even people close to tupac said by the end, of, right before Tupac died, he, he wasn't mad at He didn't really think Biggie set him up to be killed. He just was upset that Biggie didn't do more work to trying to find his killers. And, um, you know, and so that's, that, that was his, his, you know, only uh, grief at the end about Biggie. And he even said he thought Biggie and him could do, you know, concerts together again at the, at the end under something he called One Nation. So, um, so. You know, and and Chitty Macha highlighting your point about the four thousand pages. You've mentioned yeah. elsewhere that one thing, you know, in, in of the many things that I've I've lamented about this this so called commemoration of the fiftieth anniversary of hip hop is that almost no one has talked about any of the political context, but specifically the history of the rap intelligence program. Oh yeah, rap intel pro. So yeah. so when when Chitty Macha is raising this question about the the flag being raised around why would four thousand pages be held on a rapper, yeah, could you say a word or two about the rap intelligence program and yeah? Well, there's two reasons obviously, and one is that Tupac wasn't just a rapper; he was already head of the New African Panthers before he became a 
serious rapper, you know. And uh, but the other is that yes, there was a rap intelligence program. Now Nick Broomfield uh, came out with this in his film Biggie and Tupac, where he said it was in 1992 Congress convened uh, a special committee to to look at um, subversive rap. You know they were worried about subversive rap, and we when they say subversive, they mean political rap. They mean activist political rap like Tupac's. Like now, Tupac is just you know he's probably the biggest example, but he's just one of many examples. You know they they targeted Paris, they targeted uh, a number of rappers, and I, I in the first version of my book I go over a number of rappers they targeted. In the second version of my book, it still has a number of rappers, but not as many as as the first version of my book. But when the Hip Hop Summit Action Network convened, you know, where actually Eminem and P Diddy and uh, and Fifty Cent, all these people were getting together in the Hip Hop Summit Action Network with a twelve point, I think it was either ten point or twelve point program that was very radical. Uh, it involved activist professors, it involved um, people like the former head of the NAACP at that time. It just involved a number of activist uh, figures in the black community. And of course it didn't go as far as the Black Panthers, but it was very, you know, you could call it democratic socialist at the time, you know, which is uh, not as far as the Black Panthers, but still, you know, very political and very radical and very uh, subversive. And I show how each uh, number of those major figures at that Hip Hop Summit Action Network were targeted. I mean, we Did all you know, know that who, yeah. yeah, who were some of them? Public Enemy, because I know uh, uh, ODB was one of them. Eminem right. was one of them at one point. He's in right. the early rap. Right. Uh, 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 so, so in other words, the way I interpret it, correct me if I'm wrong, and then continue on. Sure. It's sure. not so much from our perspective that Eminem or some of these folks would have been radical to, in the way we would define radical, but right. it was it was a fear of any involvement in any meaningful politics right. that any celebrity might engage because exactly my own as 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 Brother Baruch has said, my own iron triangle is that you cannot be rich, famous, and radically political at the same time, and that there has never right. been a historical exception to this rule and uh uh but yeah who who else was targeted that you yeah i mean across? yeah i mean clearly um nwa was targeted by the fbi early on in 1988 there was there was looking at, F, at the uh, nwa and they um tried to get their concerts canceled uh saying that they could cause you know a riot to not get police security to you know to work at their concerts um they targeted, uh, you know, Public Enemy, as I say, uh, you know, a bit. They um, they demoted, you know, they tried to stop promotion of any political rappers and increase promotion of uh, all the most negative rappers. Um, they arrested, you know, they um, tried to, you know, discredit Eminem, but they also, you know, the head of, um, what was that, uh, Russell Simmons, they, they arrested his wife. And uh, arrested, you know, they, they they targeted him. He was a billionaire, and they they uh, targeted him for being involved in the Hip Hop Summit Action Network. They with P Diddy, for example. They um, when I was in New York, they the newscaster said this is the most money that's ever been put into a, a, a gun possession charge to try to put P Diddy in jail. That you know they they said it when the, in just the local news. The police, you know, the police have put, or the district attorney, whoever it was, put the most money ever in to trying to, to you know, get him arrested, put in jail for uh, gun possession. But so P but, Diddy was even P Diddy, who wasn't very political at all, but became involved in, in the Hip Hop Summit Action Network, was targeted. But and, now he's being, it's being said, you know, by by people like Gene Deal and uh, others that Puffy was involved in the plot. And has been allowed to, I think, even in the interview you did, to walk between that I heard today early, uh, walk between the raindrops and get away with a lot of stuff. Uh, so, so, so is the argument then? And then, well, to the to what extent is that true? And then the art would the argument then be that that those early efforts in the '90s worked in in manipulating him into to the safe confines of of silly politics and 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 reactionary uh, uh ideas it work i think that i think that they scared p diddy off of of he scared a lot of these guys out of 
the serious, you know, out of any serious politics and push them back into just trying to stay alive and do whatever they need to do to stay alive. And that's what happens is whatever they did after that. Yeah. It, it probably did have them, you know, just not, not come out with things. They weren't as committed as uh, they didn't want to lose their careers. They didn't want to lose things that they were starting to lose. They were scared to, you know, see, uh, I mean, you know, it, with uh, P. Diddy, you know, Shine got arrested for many years in that incident. The, the incident was ridiculous in the way they um, they shot at P. Diddy and Shine, and the guy that sh- shot him was a police informant. It was, and that guy, you know, nothing happened to. It's just, you know, and I can and there's case after case situation with DMX where they pretend like DMX stabbed someone. They had video that that showed no, he wasn't didn't stab anyone. And they tried to put DMX in jail, and DMX had gotten involved in the Hip Hop Some Action Network, and so they scared a lot of these people. I mean, that's really it's interesting special. because, as, as folks in the chat are, are are noting, you know, people like Ice Cube, people like uh, 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 Russell Simmons, yeah. Eminem, Diddy. These right. are not folks that that certainly in, in, in these spaces would ever have been considered as as politically threatening or radical. Yeah, but, but the hip hop action network is is was never seen as as some sort of threat from for, from some of our perspectives. But but you're saying that 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 to the to the state and the mainstream that even that was too much. Yeah, I think that was too much, and they they knew if they targeted some of the top people in that group, that they could uh, just 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 stymie and and end that hip hop summit action action network, and they did. And it was effective, you know. It's it's very sad. Um, I think if but- you do uh, to, to to this comment here, if you look at not only John's work, but I'm thinking also of the uh, Black and Blue that that hip hop doc- cop documentary that came oh, out yeah. a couple about twenty years ago, ten years ago. I can't remember now, but yeah. but they did seem to cast a wide net. They were trying to get uh, yeah. to cover everybody to 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 uh, uh, surveil yeah. every. And it's funny, your dogs are barking, my house's dogs are barking. I feel like they're talking to each other, even though they don't, they're not in the same space. But, uh, uh, and and then again, yeah. one more time, and then anything else on this that you would want to say, and then I'll check for some other questions here. But for again, for some of us, it is hard to initially hear that even Pac or uh, certainly ODB or Eminem or Diddy, wherever, or Russell Simmons, were ever politically threatening. If, well, could, Tupac, could, obviously, his, he was right. he was a leader. He was already already a national leader. Um, so, of course, he was, and his influence and what he was doing was extremely threatening to the, the people at the top. He was inspiring to people like me and you and to people around the world. He was very inspiring to Tupac was. It was just the very top, the very wealthiest who were involved in all this drug trafficking that make so much money off of our, you know, communities getting targeted this horrible way that Tupac was a threat. But um, but these others, yeah, these others are, you know, lower level in terms of OD- ODB, for example, you know, Wu-Tang Clan. He said that he thought the government killed Tupac. Um, and for saying that in the media, that was dangerous, you know, um, and he said that they're killing lots of raptivists, you know, he called them. Um, and uh, so I show the evidence of what they did to ODB for saying things like that. Now, ODB's brother was a serious activist. ODB's brother was a member of the Black you know, Liberation Movement. He was encouraging ODB to talk at rallies. And now, but they targeted ODB with drugs and, you know, arrests, fake arrests, and they shot at him. Um, they did all kinds of things to target Wu Tang Clan and ODB, you know, at that time. And of course, ODB ended up dying early. And um, so, this is just, uh, you know, one more example of, of that kind of thing, of what they were doing. So, you mentioned earlier that, uh, and, and throughout that, that a number of prominent Panthers have reached out to you supporting your work. And I'm just wondering yeah. if any have reached out, uh, Panthers or others, to, to condemn your work. In other words, has there any been any meaningful criticism that you you felt was worthy of of response? Yeah, that not, that I, not that I know of. Um, I do, you know, I um, you know, the the only thing that people have uh, you know just asked me more and pointed questions about was the issue of, of course, Elaine 
Brown because of uh, Kathleen Cleaver, you know, drama Pratt coming out with what they did about Brown and, and uh, you know, Cleaver said that Brown's book about Huey Newton was not the Huey Newton she knew and that, you know, and Fanny Shakur loved Huey Newton, of course, as, as did uh, Tupac loved Huey Newton. And for Elaine Brown to pretend like Huey Newton was something else. And now we do know that, you know, they, they mess with Huey Newton's brain in jail. We know that we really, he really, they mess with him, they manipulated him. But he came out of those manipulations, and and he was starting to do uh, good work. And he even uh, supposedly, you know, according to Tupac, he was uh, he was meeting with the former Minister of Defense of the National you know, Black Panther Party's nationally, and that was Huey Newton. So, and but, yet Cleaver but, doesn't have the best perspective. Like the the she's not the biggest fan of of, of Huey. Yeah, I, I don't know if she's a perfect fan of Huey, but yeah, she she's definitely more of a fan than Brown, of course. Than Brown, yeah, I guess. and and okay. and Cleaver as as yeah, talking to me, Kathleen Cleaver has never been negative about Huey Newton. She's always been positive about him. Now, of course, you know they mess with Huey Newton's mind. I mean, according to a CIA whistleblower, um, John Stockwell said that the Huey Newton you see right now is a direct result of CIA manipulations when he came out of jail because they mess with his head in jail. They mess with him outside jail with undercover agents. It did the same to Tupac. Um, but by the end of, uh, you know, as I say, Huey Newton's life, before he died, he was meeting with Tupac. They were working with Geronimo Pratt's freedom from jail together. They were comparing notes. So here was the former head of the National Black Panthers meeting with the head of the new african panthers at that time this is because that's what uh, tupac was was at that time when they were meeting and that was a major threat that these two you know two leaders of the two panther formations were, were meeting and strategizing um together and that was two generations of, of great black activists that could have come together and joined forces that's why they they had to kill huey newton u.s intelligence on behalf of the you know, ugly racist oligarchs. And that's what they are. The wealthiest in this nation are so incredibly racist from what I know of them. And, yeah. uh, you know, I, and, I, I, yeah, I used to watch Stockwell do interviews all the time, mm -hmm. uh, John Stockwell. And, uh, uh, and I remember him in that Lee Lou Lee documentary yeah. saying what you, what you're quoting about Huey Newton coming out of jail. Uh, one more question for me, then I'll double back on the the sure. the chat to make sure I didn't miss anything. But but did you have a relationship with Afeni Shakur and and what? Um, what Tani yeah. told me, what Tani told him, but told me she's scared um, to get political and she's scared to to keep going political. And so when I met with Afeni at a, a just a book signing, she just you know wrote this super encouraging you know uh, note to me in the book. And and said, you know, we we really appreciate what you're doing. Just know that and all. And um, and uh, but she wanted to steer clear. She was scared to, I think, go that route that I was going. And I don't blame her. You know, who can blame her? No, I don't either. It was. And again, the, I keep remember the the one time I was in a room with her was at a, an event Mc, Cynthia McKinney had put together, and uh, uh, Afeni expressed total disinterest in talking about Pac as a political figure. And it was, it was, I, I admit at the time it was, it was a little shocking and off-putting because, okay. you know, a lot of us were looking forward to hearing from her and we wanted to hear in the context of this, this discussion around a uh, COINTELPRO and Ward Churchill was there and all these other people. Uh, and then when, 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 when Afeni got to speak, it was a clear, I don't want anything to do with this. I don't want Pac associated with this in terms of like, she didn't want his memory associated. It was, it was, yeah. it was a little tense, but everybody, you know, out of respect was just, you know, but it was, but I get it. I get yeah. It. Uh, yeah. I think she was scared to death. And sadly enough, they seem to put, you know, her estranged husband that uh, I think he was a reverend or pastor, whatever he was, he was a plant. I mean, there's no doubt he was a plant because she, uh, her death was so bizarre. And the fact that her body was given back to her estranged husband, who she was in a lawsuit against in court for stealing so much money from the estate. And they give her, her body to him and oh, not, wow. to, not know to, you know, biological sister, um, you know, um, Setua. 
it's incredible. You know, it's absolutely incredible. Or to her biological, either, either her, bi, either, uh, you know, she given, should have given to Fanny's biological sister, you know, um, Gloria Cox or to her biological daughter, Setua, adult daughter, you know, and it was just biz- incredible that they gave her, her body to him and then gave this Tupac estate to the goddamn executives. You know, I don't know if I'm allowed to cuss yeah. on your show, but um, yeah. so, you know, they gave the estate to a bunch of record executives and Setua is still having to sue just to get control of uh, the estate. It's It's just incredible what they do. Have you suffered any persecution from the state due to your work? Well, my um, people have, my mail's been messed with. People have told me they've gotten my packages with nothing in them. Um, like professors who I've, you know, who professor wanted to do PR for me. Um, people, my, my interviews with uh, FM radio stations would just be, you know, hung up on out of nowhere. It's like all kinds of bizarre things. One one radio station that was interview, interviewing me was a, um, you know, a syndicated radio program and it was very large. And they said, what just happened in our studio has never happened before. All, all of our power just went out. They said over like a radio, you know, I mean, the phone line after this happened to them. And um, so I have, I've had all kinds of things happen in me trying to get this information out in a big way. Um, my phone's been messed with repeatedly. And um, my wife spent hours and hours with uh, Verizon trying to get things fixed. We, um, it, it's just all kinds of bizarre things. It's hard to even, you know, try to keep track of them all. But, you know, luckily, um, you know, I can keep talking about it in, in some way, shape and form, but shape or form. But They've definitely censored me enough that uh, they've kept me in relative obscurity, sadly enough, though. I do think that um, I am going to try to get that FBI war on Tupac Shakur film back free online if they'll allow it. Um, They've been censoring me on YouTube so much lately that I'm not sure I'll be able to, but hopefully I'll be allowed to do that. Um, But we'll see. We'll see what happens with that. Well, now that you're you back on this show, you're gonna your your levels of fame are going way up. So be be prepared for that, John. This is a big this is a big deal right here. Your world's about to change. No, <laughs> no, it. no, I agree with Slauson girl here. I appreciate your work, and uh, uh, it's very challenging, and uh, uh, and I just encourage people to grapple with it. And, you know, whether whether, again, it fully convinces you or not, it's 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 substantive and you're it it has to, I think, at minimum challenge what you think, you know, about Pac in in his history, uh, if it doesn't fully convince you. But but, John, anything you want to leave us with before we we get out of here? I definitely look forward to talking to you again uh, and and revisiting some more of your work. But uh, uh, just anything that you want to get us to 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 think about as you as you as we wrap? Um, I guess nothing else in particular. I'll I'll be uh, as I say, I'm coming out with a new film that hopefully will be out in the next six to eight months. Um, I'm just at the end of uh, going over it with my attorney to get clearance for a lot of things in it, but. Um, you know, um, yeah, that will have the actual image of uh, Greg Kading saying what he says, for example, um, and then showing people like like uh, Police Chief Parks saying the opposite. You know, just mm-hmm. showing him to be a liar about you know the fact that these Los Angeles police officers were working directly for Death Row Records, for example, and things like that. That just you know put it out in you know black and white where people can just see this stuff so clearly. Um, and, um, yeah, it's about it. I just, uh, hope people can look for themselves at least at the, uh, you know, drugs as weapons against this film, which is a majority, a majority of the film is on the Panthers and Tupac, even though it's also touches on John Lennon, Jimi Hendrix, Kurt Cobain. And it gets into the political economy of, of money laundering, drug sales, banking. I mean, it is, it is why, and and it's a challenge to those. It also raises a challenge. At some point, we should probably ask you back to talk just about this. But, but for those who increasingly engage uh, the legality around cannabis and the medicinal purposes of cannabis and other drugs, uh, in fact, seeing them as medicine and not drugs, your argument for why drugs have become popular 
in this society is a challenging one at minimum. Uh, and it, 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 I'm not going to lie. It bothers me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I'm, I hope I, you're wrong. <laughs> I'm neutral about weed. I, I am neutral. I just think that it's, you know, when the uh, powers that be are trying to roll over us, if we're all, if we're stoned all the time, we're not going to be in our sharpest wits to be able to, to counter that challenge. Um, if, if weed's medicinal, great. I don't know if it is, but if it is great, I, I just can't. I'm it is sure. John. <laughs> but, uh, you know, <laughs> so many of these universities are pushing psychedelics on us like crazy, just like they did in the sixties. And, uh, that's the key is that they're trying to push acid on us. They're trying to push ecstasy on us. They've been doing this since, you know, when MK ultra started in the 1960s, you know, really in the 1950s, it started. But they've been doing this for decades now, and now they're pretending like these are the answers, and uh, it's just the same thing revisited. Just like COINTELPRO was continued, uh, CIA's MK Ultra was continued, and um, you know it's we gotta really be wary of that stuff and uh, keep our minds as sharp as they can be. And acid and and ecstasy are not going to help that matter. Not going to help us be our sharpest. So. All right, John Potash, thank you very much. The link to his uh, website is in the show description. Please check it out. John, I really appreciate you. Thank you for coming through. I look forward to catching up with you again. That'd be great. Thanks for having me on again, Jared. It's great Anytime. talking. Peace, peace. All right, everybody. Shout out to John. Uh, been been interviewing him, dealing with his work for, for quite a while now, and I uh, really appreciate it. I hope you all check it out, uh, even even where it becomes a, 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 a challenge to my, my preferences. Got to be willing to look at it. Uh, by the way, folks, a lot of new stuff coming up on our been, been dropping on our Patreon, including today. Please consider joining and supporting there, particularly if you're if you're at all able to support or considering supporting the platform through membership move that on over to our patreon subscribe here patreon over there the links in the show description as well uh and make sure you have the bell rung so you don't miss all the other bits and pieces dropping there's a lot of stuff coming including later tonight we got ear doctor tonight and he's on tomorrow too we got extra mixes he does always so anyway thanks for coming through everybody shout out again to john potash and uh, uh as fred hampton used to say to you we say peace only if you're willing to fight for it and we'll catch you next time here at I Mix What I Like and throughout the BPM platform. Peace. I mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like.